storage days are leads to cheap remembering. Um, so if you really consider the time it takes to make the conscious decision to delete something, you know, it's actually cheaper to just store it, not worry about it, leave the email in the inbox, whatever. Um, and 9-11 kind of expedited this trend towards default remembering um, because, you know, the government, for the most part, thought it was a good idea for online service providers to just continue storing information so that they could access it, you know, solve the crime or whatever. Um, and new commercial uses for, you know, this abundance of personal information has just led to an increase in the value. Um, and so, here we are today. Remembering has become the default, whereas forgetting has been the default for all years prior. Um, and so we're going to kind of look at what that means for us. Um, so, what, what, okay. Perfect memory um, is in a lot of ways desirable. It's been the goal of technology for a while. Um, but there are some negative consequences that don't necessarily potentially results in this like unforgiving future, um, a society that is skeptical of others and wary of judgments of you know any actions that take place today, um, most of which are now digitally recorded. Um, and so a specific example is like people making decisions based on information that is not necessarily relevant, um, although it may be you know retrievable. Um, so self-censorship is kind of the ultimate threat, I guess. Um, and it's just you know, one example of the ultimate, ultimate threat, which is the digital panopticon, which is kind of the dramatic end that in theory we are heading towards. Um, and so the panopticon is basically based on Jeremy Bentham's idea for a, a prison system that's founded on the idea that people, if they think they're being observed, will act in certain ways. Um, and so the digital panopticon obviously kind of just an extension of that theory, um, and once again, you know, would yield a cold society, um, one that, you know, doesn't necessarily value participation, um, and, sorry, go ahead. Is that your concept, or did you see that somewhere? Um, the idea of the digital kind of, it's yeah. not my concept. I mean, no, 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 no. So, Foucault and Thompson, mm -hmm. what? Foucault came up with Bentham came up with it. Bentham, I mean, Bentham came up with the idea.
by, okay, so currently U.S. privacy policy is sectoral in nature, meaning it depends on legislation, regulation, and self-regulation, um, as opposed to an overarching kind of governmental regulation. Um, and that stands primarily in contrast to the EU privacy directive. Um, and the, EU, or the European Union has been characteristically kind of more active um, in you know, working towards privacy solutions for their people. Um, so Yokai Benzler uh, kind of concluded uh, the wealth of networks by noting that our present system kind of yields this institutional ecology that favors proprietary structures over non-proprietary structures and ultimately, the power lies in the, the private sector. They have the money and the motivation. I'm sorry, do you have a question? Just a question. Yeah. So uh, I know the EU privacy directive of 1995 mm -hmm. it governs both the public and the private sectors. Mm -hmm. That's why you can if the EU consider that it's privacy law stronger than the United States. Right. So why doesn't the United States legislation on privacy laws like extend beyond the public sector? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> um, one that I will certainly look into. Um, I suppose, in general, the United States might, you know, kind of value weaker legislation, um, and so that might might have something to do with it. Um, anyone else have suggestions? Yeah. Well, I, I think that's I think that's exactly it, right? Yeah. I mean, it's, it's putting, you know, the um, the power and the authority. To Helen 
trend is embalmed sees this trend as a problem because of the lack of context of you know in personal information. And so her proposed solution is kind of a corollary of purpose limitation. She suggests that not only should we kind of specify the purposes uh, for which our information should be used, but she also says we should kind of define the context in which it should be used. Um, and she defines contextual integrity as compatibility with presiding norms of information appropriateness and distribution. Um, and so while this kind of covers more bases, it still faces the same limitations. And then appropriateness is not legally defined in any way. Um, and it, it could be defined by precedent, I suppose, but it, you know, that has yet to happen. Um, so you know, the appropriateness of the use of information is kind of a vague, a vague idea and difficult to legislate around. Um, so kind of another strain of privacy policy solutions is the idea of propertization, um, which basically involves attaching trade secrecy laws to personal information and treating privacy as intellectual property. Um, and so one of the kind of highlights of this uh, or, uh, strategy, I guess, um, is that you know, this, this kind of policy can protect personal data um, without requiring a ton of bureaucracy and a ton of you know, um, kind of uh, institutional changes, I guess. Um, and it, this kind of a strategy would most likely be facilitated through technology or software like digital rights management, which I'll go on to talk about. Um, most of you are probably familiar with digital rights management, but basically it's just embedded meta information that encrypts any personal information um, so that only someone who has the rights can use it. And the most prominent example that I could think of was iTunes music. You can't just download a song from iTunes and then you know, share it with 10 of your closest friends for free. You have to have rights to it. Um, and so the Digital Millennium Copyright Act you know, enacted anti-circumvention legislation, which is one of the primary limitations, I guess, of digital rights management. Um, and then Loudon and Lessig, around the same time, both pr are proposed using similar technology um, to solve the kind of privacy policy problem um, at hand. And so one such application is the creation of the national information market, where users basically sell their personal information um, to vendors. Um, and it's an interesting concept because it does redirect some of the value of personal information that you know online service providers are benefiting from, and it redirects value to the user or the individual. Um, however, it, it obviously would be really difficult to implement. It would involve you know a complete restructuring of our current system, and so it's not necessarily practical, but theoretically it's kind of interesting to think about. Um, so, more limitations. Um, not only does it require infrastructure, the, develop, or the, the development of infrastructure and the adoption of it, um, but it's characteristically not super hard to navigate. It's definitely not, or circumnavigate, or reverse engineer, and it's definitely not impossible. Um, and not only that, but if someone does have the rights to it, there's nothing really stopping them from just like, for instance, filming a movie with you know an external device, and that you know decreases the quality of the information, but that might not always be the case. Technology is always improving. And obviously that's not legal under current legislation, but it do, you know, doesn't necessarily stop it from happening. Um, also, it requires enforcement by law. Um, and kind of, uh, well, as Meyer Schoenberger, who I mentioned, says, facilitates the culture of denial, um, which focuses on prohibition and control. And not only that, but it is dependent on surveillance of people, um, which is ultimately kind of ironic as we consider, you know, the ends that we are trying to avoid in this, you know, in this system. Um, so private or privacy management systems are another proposed solution uh, proposed by Edward Felton, and this is kind of based on the idea of negotiating usage between two parties, um, and then the policies are then confidential. This kind of strategy doesn't require any kind of infrastructure, um, but the limitation is that it would be hugely time-consuming to sit down and have a discussion about you know the rights of your information or your rights and you know the use of your information every time you exchange information, which I think is what he is suggesting. <laughs> um, and so it's also kind of interesting conceptually, but um, not practical, just because the system is really efficient as it is currently set up. 
and people aren't really concerned enough at this point about you know their rights um, to really pursue justice in this kind of a manner. So um, the or, okay, the idea of information ecology comes up, and it's not really a new idea, um, but it basically just um, concerns the constraints of information that are you know and how it can be collected, stored by whom, and for how long. Um,
concerned with um, like government policy on how the government stores information, but um, one thing that I always think about is what the uh, future president of the United States right now is a college student, maybe here in Michigan, who knows, and like going to parties, putting up Facebook pictures of them, like plastered and all that kind of stuff, and I'm sure presidents nowadays did that when they were young, but there wasn't Facebook back then. Right. So it seems like it's more like people voluntarily giving their information out is a huge, is a much bigger uh, issue or concern, or maybe it's not, but that's kind of the thing that I always think about is like, what's gonna happen 20, 30 years from now when our generation that grew up with Facebook and just posting, like, okay, so there's this uh, article on the slate, it's called uh, Vote For Me, Not My Facebook Profile, but it's saying like tips for people nowadays thinking about running for office, and it's like, you know, don't join, uh, don't join Facebook groups like, I paint my nails like a blind Parkinson's patient. <laughs> you know, because, wow. because yeah. <laughs> well that, that group exists, but like don't do that because, you know, in the future when someone who used to work at Facebook has a copy of the archive or something like that and they start digging in like, oh, this person's a presidential candidate, let's go back into our archive and try to find what groups they joined. And I don't know, just all sorts of crazy stuff yeah. that is now public, it's like public information virtually. And Absolutely. And that's, I mean, that is like kind of one of the issues that inspired this project. Um, and that is kind of where the whole idea of digital forgetting or forgiving kind of comes in. So it's like, it's unlikely that everyone or all of this information that we are putting up now will be completely destroyed. You know, it's preserved somewhere. And so, you know, the future president will really be needing some support from us or whoever, you know, to like be willing to accept kind of I mean, maybe like we're gonna be like the voting block, you know, like the main, you know the, the 30, 40, 50, 60 year olds, like you know, like we're the big voters, and maybe like since we're, we grew up with it, mm -hmm. we grew up with Facebook, we'll understand yeah. that people took pictures of everything.
<laughs> right? If you have the same name as like a terrorist or like a child molester, it could be a real problem. <laughs> And then information that you put out there that you were just stupid to put out there. Right? Yeah. So my nephew is an idiot. <laughs> on his Facebook page. And I love this kid. But I'm like, you are really dumb. And they have these pictures up there. And he, as much as I want to counsel him to take them off, those are accurate representations of him. And he felt compelled to put them out on the internet. So if I were an employer, I think I would have a legitimate interest in knowing that my employee was this dumb. Mm -hmm. Does that make any sense? Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know.
start your Facebook account, if you go back on after you've yeah. left, they yeah, say all there. the information is oh, still yeah. there, and they say, welcome back. You know, right, like, yeah. Oh, that was so kind of you. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, I guess that's sure. obviously a relevant example to look into for our for all phone. Well, I didn't have this on
articles that you cite might actually give you some of that, uh, so that you could look at, at things like Facebook and Google search, and, and uh, I mean, these are the most controversial ones, Amazon, some of the, the more popular uh, buying sites and the like, and how they approach this issue. Uh, the other thing is that uh, you did the pros and cons of the theoretical approaches, but you might look at you know who are the that are trying to argue for indefinitely keeping this information. Right. Or good guys. I mean, you know, I don't mean to set it that way, but I mean, who are the people that, are that really essentially are, are interested in maintaining records indefinitely? Uh, that could be law enforcement agencies, it could be government agencies, it could be all kinds of things. Right. I mean, that's definitely something I plan to kind of integrate into the paper. Um, yeah, that would, that would Ha, ha, ha.